This episode is made possible by the realistic online game War Thunder. Check out this game through the link in the description below. Going through that link not only supports this show, but you also get a free premium tank or aircraft and three days of premium time as a bonus. And let's get into it. During the late 19th century, a German man named Otto Lilienthal achieved some of the first successful repeated flights using gliders. Regrettably, he suffered a crash on August the 9th, 1896, and he died the next day. Reportedly, his last words were, sacrifices must be made. This was mentally shared by all the pioneers of flight. During the inception of aviation, there were few professions out there that were more dangerous. A quick look at all the pilots from the first decades of flight, and you will find that very few of them got to see retirement after a long and successful career. If you'll pardon the cliché, these men were simply made of sterner stuff than the rest. One of these daredevils was Australian Charles Kingsford Smith. He discovered his passion for flying during World War I, and for the rest of his life, he always looked for new opportunities to soar through the skies. In the process, he set a number of world firsts, such as the first trans-Pacific flight from the United States to Australia. Unfortunately, like many of his peers, Kingsford Smith's career ended in tragedy, and his final resting place remains, to this day, a mystery. Born on February 9, 1897, in Hamilton, a suburb of Brisbane, Australia, Charles Edward Kingsford Smith was the seventh child of a banker named William Charles Smith and Catherine Mary Nee Kingsford. Although the family originally simply went by Smith, they added the surname Kingsford in 1903 when they relocated to Canada. The move did not last long, and in 1907, the Kingsford Smiths were back in Australia, but this time in Sydney. Charles became known as Smithy, a nickname that he would carry for the rest of his life. When he was nine years old, Charles almost drowned at Bondi Beach when he got dragged out to sea by a rip current. The young boy struggled to stay afloat, but eventually lost consciousness. He was saved just in time by the lifeguard service, which had only recently come into existence existence, and he was resuscitated by a nurse who was in the right place at the right time. Later, during his aviation career, people said that Kingsford Smith was terrified of flying over the ocean and would get sick whenever he did it. This event at the beach may have been the genesis of his angst. As a teenager, Charles enrolled at a technical school where he studied to become an engineer. He also joins the Senior Cadets, a military youth organization. After the outbreak of World War I, Kingsford Smith enlisted in the Australian Imperial Force in February 1915. The 18-year-old took part in the Gallipoli campaign, where he served as a sapper with the 4th Signal Troop, 2nd Division Signal Company. This is where he had his second brush with death. As he described in a letter to his parents, he heard some ping noises very close to him. When he finally reached shelter, Kingsford Smith noticed that a bullet had come so close to his head that it had frayed the edge of his cap. Later, he became a dispatch rider during campaigns in Egypt and France. After being promoted to sergeant, Smithy transferred to the Australian Flying Corps in October of 1916. This is where he got his first taste of flying and developed a passion that would follow him for the rest of his life. He trained in England, where he showed immediate aptitude as a pilot. He was commissioned as second lieutenant with the Royal Flying Corps, the RFC, the precursor to the Royal Air Force. Kingsford Smith, he was sent to the French front as part of the number 23 squadron. There, he shot down four enemy aircraft, as well as launching multiple attacks on ground targets and balloons. Inevitably, Smithy was bested in a dogfight and was shot down himself. He walked away from the crash, although his injuries did require amputation of several toes. Kingsford Smith received the Military Cross for conspicuous gallantry and devotion to duty. Because his recuperation would take a long time, he was allowed to visit his parents and Australia, and upon returning was promoted to captain and assigned as a flying instructor. By the time Smithy was fully healed, the war it had ended. He wasn't sure what he wanted to do with his life, but he knew that it had to involve flying. He teamed up with another pilot named Cyril Maddox and formed a joy flight company that offered pleasure airplane trips throughout England. However, the young Smith was already looking for opportunities that would bring him fame and fortune. In 1919, Australian Prime Minister Billy Hughes announced the Great Air Race. A prize of £10,000 would be awarded to the first person who completed a flight from 
Great Britain to Australia in under 30 days. Unsurprisingly, Kinsford Smith wanted to take part in that race, but he was denied membership into the Royal Aero Club of Australia (RACA) and by default entry into the competition. Officials were concerned over Smithy's lack of navigational experience over the 11,180-mile route and thought that it would be dangerous to let him race. Instead, the prize was claimed by brothers Sir Ross and Keith McPherson Smith. Although he was not allowed to compete in the great air race, an idea sprouted in Smithy's mind. It was another surefire way to glory, the first trans-Pacific flight from the United States to Australia. Spoiler alert, this would be the feat that brought him everlasting fame, but now was not the time. Kingsford Smith traveled to America to search for sponsors for his daring escapade, but he failed to find any. He occupied his time with other flying gigs, which included stunt work for a circus and for Hollywood movies. However, he saw another pilot die in an accident and decided that the job was too risky, even for him. He returned to Australia in 1921. He might have had it with life as a stunt pilot, but the experience did not detract from Smithy's pleasure of flying. Back home, he started another joy flying company. He also became a salaried pilot with West Australian Airways. Started by another RFC veteran, Sir Norman Brearley, this was the first Australian airline with a scheduled air service. In his personal life, Smithy married Thelma Eileen Hope Corboy in 1923. By all accounts, it was an unhappy marriage that only lasted a few years, as Kingsford Smith was not made for a stable life in one place. His biographer, Ian McCursey, said that the aviator's mind was always in the sky, thinking about the next time that he would be able to fly. When he was on the ground, Kingsford Smith, he enjoyed women, booze, and spending his money almost as fast as he made it. Smithy believed there was huge potential for an airmail service in Australia. Together with another aviator called Charles Ulm, he started the Interstate Flying Services, but found it difficult securing contracts. To show people that airmail was the future, the two pilots wanted to perform some demonstration flights to attract sponsors and investors. They did a round trip of Australia in a little over 10 days, which garnered plenty of attention. Sensing an opportunity to secure funding, Kingsford Smith forgot all about his airmail business and instead, once again, promoted his true dream. The Trans-Pacific Flight. This time, it worked. Kingsford Smith not only obtained a grant from the government of New South Wales, but also received financial backing from two businessmen, Meyer Department Store founder Sidney Meyer and California oil tycoon George Allen Hancock. First off, they had to buy a plane. Smithy and Ulm traveled all the way to America to find the one that they wanted, but bizarrely, they ended up buying one from another Australian. Specifically, they purchased a Fokker F7 from polar explorer Sir Hubert Wilkins. It started life as the Detroiter, but Smith rechristened it the Southern Cross. The goal was to take off from Oakland, California and finish in Australia. This was not a non-stop flight, so they would need to refuel two times, the first of which would be in Hawaii. Over the previous year, ten pilots had died attempting to do this leg of the trip. In the odds, they were not in their favor, but the airmen were determined to carry on. Kingsford Smith had a four-man team. He was the pilot, while Ulm acted as relief pilot. On board were also two Americans, James Warner, who was the radio operator, and Harry Leon, who served as navigator. The four Awesome took off from Oakland on May 31, 1928. They reached the islands of Kauai to refuel after an uneventful 27 hours. From there, they set off on the longest stage of their journey to Fiji. To make matters worse, they encountered a massive lightning storm, but nevertheless, they reached the island of Suva in one piece. The final stage saw them fly into Brisbane Airport to a hero's welcome as tens of thousands of people cheered them on. After 83 hours and 38 minutes of flying time, Kingsford Smith and his crew completed the first ever Trans-Pacific flight. Now, just before we continue on the adventure today, I do want to quickly thank the sponsor of today's episode, War Thunder. You know, a lot of flying in this episode, and you can do it without all the danger and expense in War Thunder, but the best way is for me to show you that. So let's jump over to the computer. So welcome to War Thunder. I I've played planes before, I think, in a couple of these little reads, but tanks are also fun. Uh, I'm going to play as Germany, because why not? Also, in War Thunder, there are 1,200 different vehicles that you can choose from and different modifications you can do. If you just, you're in the hangar here, you can do the uh, modifications so you, you can uh, add different parts and uninstall things. Like, if you really want to, you can uninstall the brake system. Okay, so it's kind of like a capture the flag sort of styly thing. That's what we're going to be doing. This, this dude's just having a nap down there. <laughs> What's up with that dude? It's like, dude, wake up, we're going to battle. Come on, man. Oh, look, he does look to the side. Oh, extinguish that fire. 
Oh, I appear to... Oh, there's many enemies. Oh, there are many enemies. That's where they're hiding. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a proper tank this time. I think that would be smart rather than just, uh, just a basically a convertible car. Oh my god. Ammunition load burnt? Yeah, that did not look good. Oh look, here he comes. That's going straight into my body. Oh! Oh! That's incredible! But these four dudes, oh I'm sorry, you're so screwed. So that is War Thunder. Join us on the battlefield for free using the link below. Doing that supports the show and also gets you a free premium tank or aircraft and three days of premium time as a bonus for registering. And let's get back to it. Kingsford Smith received a ton of rewards for his feat, including the Air Force Cross, an honorary position as squadron leader with the Royal Australian Air Force, and over £20,000 in funding. Now that the Trans-Pacific flight was out of the way, he could focus again on his more practical ambition, that of establishing an airmail company. In August of 1928, just a few months after his journey across the Pacific, Smithy performed the first non-stop flight across mainland Australia, taking off from Point Cook near Melbourne and landing in Perth. Less than a month later, Later, he already had a new ambition to be the first to fly across the Tasman Sea to New Zealand. Not only would this have been another gratifying feather in Smithy's aviator cap, but he hoped that it would also secure an airmail contract between the two countries. At the time, achieving the first trans-Tasman flight was the next big thing for many Australian and New Zealand aviators. However, in January of that year, two Kiwi pilots named John Moncrieff and George Hood disappeared over the sea while attempting the flight. No trace of their plane has ever been found. Kingsford Smith's venture in September 1928 was the first attempt since their disappearance. He had a crew of four again. Charles M was by his side as relief pilots, and joining them were radio operator Thomas McWilliams and navigator Harold Arthur Litchfield. They boarded the Southern Cross and took off on September the 10th. After a flight of 14 hours and 25 minutes, they landed at Wigram Airport in Christchurch. Tens of thousands of people were there to cheer them on, including students and public servants who were given the day off for this momentous occasion. With another world first under his belt, Kingsford Smith was the talk of the town once again, but he would soon find himself involved in a few controversies with fatal consequences that had a lasting impact on his reputation. Now that the trans-Tasman flight was also out of the way, Kingsford Smith's pragmatic side started showing again. In 1929, he intended to fly to England to purchase four new aircraft for his budding company. He took a crew with him aboard the Southern Cross, but had to make an emergency landing in the middle of nowhere in Western Australia. The crew was safe, but the plane was in no condition to fly, so they patiently waited for rescue. Of course, the disappearance of a hero of the statue of Charles Kingsford Smith prompted a massive search involving many other pilots. Among them were two of his friends named Keith Anderson and Bobby Hitchcock. They flew aboard the Kookaburra, hoping to spot a sign of the downed airplane. Unfortunately, they also suffered problems and crash-landed in the Tanami Desert. While Smithy and his crew would be found and rescued, these two pilots died of exposure. It hardly seemed fair to blame Kingsford Smith for the tragedy, but rumors soon started circulating that the forced landing of the Southern Cross had been nothing but a publicity stunt. The media sensed a juicy story and fanned the flames of controversy. Some even accused the aviator of purposefully making it harder for search teams to find them. That way, the longer they stayed gone, the more press they would receive. The incident became known as the Coffee Roll Affair, named so after the black coffee and brandy drink which the crew of the Southern Cross purportedly drank while awaiting rescue. An official inquiry was launched into the matter, and although Kingsford Smith was exonerated, his reputation it was tarnished in Australia. Overseas, everyone still loved Smithy, so he climbed into his trusty Southern Cross and took to the skies for a few more headline-grabbing flights. In June 1930, he completed an east-west crossing of the Atlantic from Ireland to America in 31 and a half hours. This also meant that he had completed a circumnavigation of the world, which he first started with his Trans-Pacific journey. Later that year, he won an air race from England to Australia, breaking the speed record while flying solo. 
Alongside Charles Ulm in 1929, Smithy finally founded the airline that he had dreamed of for years, which he called Australian National Airways. It commenced operations in January of 1930 with five airplanes with Kingsford Smith himself flying the Southern Cloud. The company wasn't around for long, though. The airline had to close down following another landmark moment in the history of aviation, but one that Kingsford Smith could certainly have done without. The first airliner to disappear during a flight. On March 21, 1931, the Southern Cloud left Sydney for Melbourne. Kingsford Smith was not the one flying. On board were two crewmen and six passengers. They all perished in a crash in the snowy mountains of New South Wales due to bad weather. Their final location it remained a mystery for 27 years until a hiker named Tom Sonter stumbled upon the wreckage. It goes to show that back then, being a passenger on an airplane took about as much courage as being a pioneering aviator. The Southern Sun also crashed while trying to make the first airmail delivery from Australia to England. Charles Kingsford Smith spent all of his time and money convincing everyone that flying was a safe and practical way to transport mail and people in order to start a successful airline. But once it finally launched his company, it showed them the exact opposite. Back then, at least, it seemed that flying was anything but safe. It seems that almost every other plane that Kingsford Smith piloted, apart from the Southern Cross, was destined for tragedy. In 1931, he added a new aircraft to his collection, the Avro Avian Mark V. He dubbed it the Southern Cross Minor. He wanted to use it to set a new speed record for the Australia-England flight, but was unsuccessful. He sold it a few years later to another aviation pioneer, British pilot Bill Lancaster. Lancaster had a career worthy of mention here. It mirrored that of Kingsford Smith and was highlighted by triumphs, controversies, and death. He also started flying during World War One and later pursued it as a career. In 1927, he achieved one of the longest flights in a small aircraft by journeying from England to Australia. He was accompanied by his lover, Jesse Chubby Miller, who became a successful aviatrix in her own right. A few years later, the two were living in Miami, Florida. While Lancaster was in Mexico looking for work, they brought in a writer named Hayden Clark to help Miller write her memoirs. They started an affair, and Miller even decided to leave Lancaster for her new beau. Upon hearing this, the aviator he returned home, and soon enough, Clark was found dead from a gunshot to the head. Lancaster was charged with murder. His alibi didn't hold water, and he admitted to forging two suicide notes. He had recently purchased a revolver, and witnesses heard him say that he would get rid of Clark. You would think that this would be a rather open and shut case, but Lancaster was actually found not guilty. He might have dodged prison, but his reputation took a big hit, and Lancaster became a pariah. He was desperate to regain just a fraction of his lost prestige, and that is where the Southern Cross Minor came in. Lancaster decided to go for the England to South Africa speed record, as that was the in vogue flight of the day. He bought the plane from Kingsford Smith and set off on April the 11th, 1933. Everything that could go wrong, though, it did. Lancaster had gotten lost several times and fell behind schedule. He was also so sleep deprived that officials tried to detain him when he landed for refueling. He ignored them and pressed on and crashed in the Sahara Desert. Miraculously, the pilot escaped from the ordeal almost unscathed. He did have a serious problem, though, as he was now stranded in the middle of the Sahara Desert with very few supplies. He waited to be rescued, occasionally firing off flares, but the rescue never came. Lancaster died eight days later, on April 20, 1933. It was almost 30 years before French troops found his mummified corpse and the wreck of the Southern Cross Miner. He had left behind a diary detailing his last days on Earth, which was later published with Miller's permission. What's left of the plane sits in the Queensland Museum. In 1935, Kingsman Smith had a very close call in the Southern Cross while attempting the first trans-Tasman airmail flight. One of the plane's three motors stopped due to a damaged propeller blade. The three men aboard the craft only survived because Smithy's co-pilot, P.G. Taylor, climbed out of the cockpit and transferred oil from the dead motor to the others using a suitcase and a thermos flask. Kingsford Smith had to dump all the mail and cargo and barely made it back to Sydney. This was a sign that perhaps it was time to retire the Southern Cross. Smithy purchased a new plane, a Lockheed Altair, called the Lady Southern Cross. He sold his famous airplane to the Commonwealth of Australia so that it could be put on display in a museum. At first, the new aircraft appeared to be a worthy replacement. With it, Kingsford Smith performed the first eastward flight over the Pacific Ocean, going from Australia to the United States. In 1935, he decided to use it in order to break the England to Australia speed record. He set off on November 6, 1935. With Smithy was co-pilot Tommy Pethy 
Cambridge. His longtime flying partner, Charles Ulm, had vanished and presumably had died a year prior while flying over the Hawaiian Islands. Unfortunately, this was a fate that the two would share, because the Lady Southern Cross also disappeared over the ocean. On November the 8th, it took off from India and was headed to Singapore, but it was never seen again. It is presumed the plane crashed in the Andaman Sea off the coast of Burma, killing Charles Kingsford Smith and his co-pilot. A year and a half after the disappearance, an undercarriage leg and wheel washed up on the shore of an island and remains the only part ever recovered from the Lady Southern Cross. In recent times, filmmaker Damien Lay claimed in 2009 to have found the wreckage of the airplane. His proclamation has been met with much skepticism from experts and aviation historians. He has not made the location public and presumably is still trying to raise funds for a recovery expedition. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below and don't forget to subscribe. We've got brand new videos just like this four times a week. Also, please do check out our sponsor, link below. And as always, thank you for watching.